So this provided the basis for uh, what became a, a conspiracy theory that spun out from that, which was that this was somehow an orchestrated attempt by the Catholic Church to destroy Lincoln, to somehow turn the United States, you know, closer into a, a, a Catholic influenced or, or Catholic dominated sort of country. Welcome to the Acton Line podcast, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Gabriel Jaja, producer. Kevin Schmiesing, director of research at the Freedom and Virtue Institute, takes you on a journey through American history to more than two dozen sites and events that symbolize and embody America's rich Catholic past in his new book, A Catholic Pilgrimage Through American History, People and Places That Shaped the Church in the United States. You can find additional resources in the show notes of this episode, as well as previous episodes on our website at acton.org slash podcast. If you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Act in Line is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Welcome. My name is Dan Huger, Librarian and Research Associate at the Acton Institute. Today I am joined by Kevin Schmiesing. Kevin lectures on church history for Mount St. Mary's Seminary and School of Theology in Cincinnati, Ohio, and serves as Director of Research at the Freedom and Virtue Institute. He served as a research fellow at the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty from 1999 to 2020. Schmiesing is co-host of the podcast Catholic History Trek on Spotify and YouTube and has contributed to Catholic World Report and Crisis Magazine. He is the author of Merchants and Ministers and Within the Market Strife, an editor of One and Indivisible, Catholicism and Historical Narrative, and The Spirit Matters. His most recent book and the subject of our conversation today is A Catholic Pilgrimage Through American History – People and Places That Shaped the Church in the United States, published by Ave Maria Press. Today, we'll be discussing a few of these people and places, the place of Catholicism in American history, and the place of Catholics in American life. Kevin, welcome to Act in Line, and thank you for being with us. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate the opportunity. Your book begins, as, as all great books begin, uh, with a joke, and it's an old family joke, and like all the best jokes, there's a theological lesson there. Uh, would you care to let us in on the joke? Sure, yeah. It's probably not the funniest joke in the world, but you know how it is. Within the family, it was humorous at the time. So um, it's uh, there are, are six kids in my family, five siblings and I, and uh, started off with three brothers. So you can imagine three brothers in relatively rapid succession in the same household, we like to we like to give our mother a hard time. And one of the things she would often say when we were younger, especially when we were uh, going out on trips or vacations or whatever, she'd say, we're going on a pilgrimage. And sometimes um, she would even talk in those terms when we were just going to our grandma's house, which was about 20, 30 minutes away, there happened to be a Catholic shrine nearby, which is one of the chapters in the book, by the way. Um, but the, the joke became, you know, basically every time we're stepping outside our door, we're going on a pilgrimage somewhere. Um, <clears throat> and so just kind of making fun of her in that way. Uh, but as I talk about in the introduction, with the benefit of hindsight and upon reflection, I realize now that she was expressing, even if sometimes in a lighthearted way, she was expressing, as you described it, a theological truth um, that uh, as Christians, we believe that we are on pilgrimage in this life itself. That is, our time on earth is a, is a, is a, is a temporary stay. We're on pilgrimage to another place, that the place of the afterlife, the eternal. Um, and and also that more practically and more directly in the sense mom intended it that uh, you know where where we go while we're on this earth can can be turned into a pilgrimage everywhere we go can be turned into a pilgrimage in the sense that it has a spiritual meaning it has a, a spiritual end or purpose to it um, and so I've really over the years 
eventually, gradually begun to take uh, mom's notion more and more to heart. And, and my own family has kind of established the same sorts of practices that uh, that uh, that our family did when I was younger. And and now whenever we travel anywhere, I look for some kind of pilgrimage site along the way so we can we can stop in and, and turn this uh, vacation or uh, uh, travels of whatever kind they are uh, into a pilgrimage. Wonderful. And, 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 and your book is a great, as it works in, in one way as an atlas that, uh, that other families, uh, can join in this sort of practice. Now there is a wonderful sort of academic renaissance in Catholic history. Um, there are so many great publications you've written extensively on, on Catholic history and you've contributed to that academic legacy. Um, this book seems to me to fill like a great niche as an introduction to those sort of works for a popular audience. How do you hope that the book will be received among Catholics, both in the pews and, and, and priests in the rectories at the, at the sort of parish level? Right. I appreciate you raising that point, Dan, because that really was one of the intentions behind the book. Uh, I noticed, I've noticed for many years, a disconnect uh, of some degree between the academic history that's being done in the field of religious studies, in the field of church history, in the field of American Catholicism, and what the average Catholic in the pew, or the average American for that matter, understands about the place of the Catholic church, the Catholic people in the American past. And so it's become kind of a mission of mine, um, manifested in some of the popular articles I've written online and now in this book to help to bring some of that academic information, that research to a broader audience. There's so much great history done in the field of American Catholic history, especially over the last 10 or 20 years. Um, as, as you mentioned, uh, there's just been a proliferation of work in this field. Um, a lot of great stuff, a lot of original research, a lot of going back to the documents and uncovering uh, uh, you know, new figures, new events, uh, new angles on familiar events. And so I really wanted to bring some of that stuff to a broader audience, and that was part of the intention behind this book. Um, how will priests, clergy, Catholics in the in, in the pews take it? Uh, that remains to be seen. I guess <laughs> I'm very hopeful about it. Um, I did a lot of legwork on this book, both in terms of making sure that it was sound from an academic perspective. I consulted a lot of experts in fields where I didn't have particular expertise in, in areas and regions and, and, and time frames that I didn't have particular expertise to try to make sure that it was uh, you know, historically sound, but I also did legwork in in having folks from different walks of life read the book, read early drafts of the book, so that uh, they could they could uh, give me a sense of whether it was uh, reaching its goal of being accessible to to the average reader. And so I, I did uh, make some modifications based on that feedback um, and. I have reason to hope that I was successful. The feedback so far has been good. Um, a lot of people are buying the book. A lot of people are reading the book. Um, and so far, the feedback has been nothing but encouraging. I, I, I can add my, my, my name to that chorus of positive feedback. I think this works really, really well um, for those audiences. And this book is filled with wonderful historical vignettes, which sort of crisscross the nation, both geographically and culturally, what do you hope readers will take away from these juxtapositions, um, from settings as diverse as, you know, Alaska to Florida, um, to folks of all sorts of different ethnic backgrounds, all sorts of historical periods? What is, what is that, what, what do you hope that mix does to the imagination of the reader? And, and, and what, what do you hope that they that they take away from that that diversity in the uh, in the historical episodes you highlight? Yeah, again, an astute observation that was uh, very deliberately done. I tried to be chronological, cultural, geographically diverse in many ways um, across the entire scope of American history. Um, and I suppose one of the things I'm trying to accomplish by that, well, first of all, kind of at a, at a very obvious level. I want to cover, you know, the scope of American history. I don't want this to be a provincial history. Um, I think it's probably the case that 
the average Catholic who picks up this book will be familiar with at least one or two of these places. Probably they live not too far away from one of them, and they'll say, oh, I already know that story. Um, now, they still may learn a few things, even in, in those chapters, um, but there will be stories that they're familiar with. But what I what I like about this, or what I hope it does, is that it exposes a national audience, or even an international audience, to some of these places that may have local notoriety, um, but that are amazing stories, but are not, you know, widely known outside a local geographical area. So the other thing more broadly that I hope that this accomplishes is just to give people a sense of the richness and variety of the Catholic experience in the United States. Um, American Catholicism is composed of a lot of different kinds of people from a lot of different backgrounds, ethnicities, uh, cultures, all those kinds of things. Um, and they all work together to, to make up what is uh, this um, American Catholic Church. And so I think the book can contribute to an appreciation of that fact. You definitely get a sense that that the church is a here comes everybody kind of place. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> and it's and it's wonderful in that sense. Now, we're, I'd like to turn to actually digging into some of these some of these places, some of these events, and I think a great place to start is is uh, St. Mary's City. Now, every American school child learns about Plymouth Rock and those first, uh, you know, Reformed Protestant settlements. But St. Mary's City, you might get a cursory, you know, oh, Maryland was a, was a Catholic colony, but you don't have a real picture of what that meant painted for you oftentimes. What does this tell us about the place of Catholics in the American colonial story, this this particular instance in Maryland. Yeah, that's exactly the backstory behind that chapter, Dan. It's it, it's a personal backstory uh, because I was, uh, and I'm not trying to diss at all the education I received. It was in many ways an excellent education, but I went through Catholic elementary schools and high schools for 13 years, and I didn't know a thing about the colony of Maryland, which is just kind of extraordinary. The, the American history I learned was the, the conventional narrative, which basically started at Plymouth Rock and in Jamestown. Those, those were, the, those were uh, the, the starting point, points for American history. And so as a Catholic, I just thought it was uh, uh, astounding that I knew nothing about this, what began as essentially a Catholic colony. It was really an ecumenical colony, but uh, it was it was intended as a haven for Catholics. So St. Mary's City, uh, the, the, the starting point for uh, the colony of Maryland, 1634, the first two boats land, the Ark and the Dove. And uh, this is an experiment in religious liberty, actually, uh, because it would, the, the colony of Maryland was granted to the first Lord Baltimore um, for the purposes of creating a haven for Catholics, because Catholics elsewhere in Great Britain, in England, um, had a fairly difficult life in the 17th century, uh, in the post-Reformation era. Um, in large measure, the, at least the public expression of Catholicism was outlawed. And so uh, it was thought that Maryland could be a place where Catholics could enjoy the practice of their faith in a way they hadn't been able to in England for some time. But more than that, it was, as I say, an experiment in religious liberty, because even on those first two ships that arrived, it was not exclusively Catholics. It was a mixture of Catholics and Protestants. Um, and the idea was that both groups could get along in this in this new colony, kind of creating a new beginning for um, uh, for British Christians of both Catholic and Protestant stripes. I tell the rest of the story in that chapter. I won't go into the details here, but it the experiment to some degree failed in the Maryland colony, at least in the near term. But I I think one could say that it was picked up uh, in the American colonies more broadly and eventually given shape and, and enjoyed success uh, after independence in 1776, and particularly with the ratification of the Constitution and the First Amendment, that this experiment in religious liberty eventually uh, won out in the American experience. A promising start, maybe a false start, but leading to a, to a contributing to a broader legacy um, no, that's that's very. It's a fascinating story. Um, 
Now, Catholics as as often, and, and this gets into a little bit of the of the of the uh, of the turn in the story of Maryland, is Catholics have historically faced a lot of prejudice in the United States and been viewed by suspicion by by other Americans. Now, one of the ways these sorts of suspicions often manifest themselves is they they become a fertile ground for sort of conspiracy theories. And you detail one in particular which took shape after the assassination of President Lincoln. What is what became known as sort of the the Catholic conspiracy to kill the president? Yeah, right. Well, (laughs) so this is not, as you know, Dan, because you've read the book, this is not an anti-American book. And I think we'll talk more about that later. Um, With that said, you know, I do not avoid or ignore the theme of anti-Catholicism and the difficulties and the ho- even the hostility that the church faced, that Catholic people faced in the United States. It, uh, it, it comes into play in a number of the chapters, and the one you're talking about, the Lincoln assassination, is one of those. So um, as with much anti-Catholicism, there is a kernel of truth in uh, the uh, conspiracies that were circulating around the, the Lincoln assassination. So the, the basic story is this. Lincoln was assassinated, of course, in, in 1865 following the, the Civil War. And um, investigation after the assassination uncovered the fact that there had been a conspiracy initially to kidnap Lincoln and then later turning into an assassination attempt. Uh, so, so that was a fact. There was an assassination. There was a group of people who were working together to uh, try to kill the president. It's also true that several of those people were Roman Catholics um, of one variety or another. And uh, among those, the boarding house at which the conspirators met was run by Mary Surratt. And Mary Surratt's son, John Surratt, was involved in the conspiracy. Uh, Both of those are historical facts that I don't think anyone disputes. and, And both of those individuals were Catholic. So this provided the basis for uh, what became a a conspiracy theory that spun out from that, which was that this was somehow an orchestrated attempt by the Catholic Church um, to to destroy Lincoln, to somehow turn the United States closer uh, into a a Catholic um, influenced or, or Catholic dominated sort of country. Exactly how that works, it's hard to tell because it's not quite clear how the assassination of Lincoln um, accomplishes that. But yeah. <laughs> but there's the part of the theory is is that Lincoln was somehow uh, somehow was an anti Catholic force himself and was and was you know was keeping the church at bay that kind of thing. So. Um, Lots more to that story. You can read more about it in the chapter. Uh, but that was that was the basic argument. And uh, uh, Mary Surratt was executed for her role in in the Lincoln assassination, although it's not clear even to this day um, whether she played an active role or she was just kind of an unwitting bystander that, that the that the conspirators were meeting in her boarding house. Uh, Dr. Samuel Mudd, another one uh, on whom the chapter focuses more. Uh, he also a Catholic. Um, but not clear whether he was actively involved in the conspiracy or, again, just a bystander who happened happened to treat John Wilkes Booth uh, a- after he escaped after the assassination. Yeah. I mean, there's there's a whole in the chapter, there's there's even like diplomatic fallout for this in terms of the relations between the United States and the papal states, because this conspiracy has so much currency among among a lot of folks uh, at the time. Um, now there is this sort of anti-Catholic prejudice on the one hand, and then there's the nation's sort of long troubling, uh, racial history, history of racial prejudice, uh, animus, and, and even many times that being ensconced into law or just, uh, leaking into other institutions in the United States, one of the fascinating things I learned when reading this was about the nation's first uh, first black priest who, um, you know, there were no seminaries at the time open to African-Americans. Could you let us in a little bit on on sort of the the struggles there and uh, and the eventual triumph? 
Right. This is one of my favorite stories, Dan. It's chapter 23 in the book. Uh, and, and in fact, um, I'll just I'll just mention this because this kind of highlights the very practical use of the book, which you alluded to earlier as a kind of travel guide. Uh, my family actually used this book as a travel guide just about three, four weeks ago. We were returning from a wedding in Denver, a family wedding. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I, I try to look for pilgrimage sites along the way. And since I had just published the book. Actually, the book had not released yet, but I had my author copy in hand. So we took the, uh, the, the, the copy of the book with us. Um, and I noticed that Quincy, Illinois was near our trip, uh, near our, our, uh, our uh, travel route on the way back. And I had never been to Quincy, Illinois, but I had written all about Quincy, Illinois and the story of Father Augustus Tolton for chapter 23 in the book. And so we read the chapter aloud as we neared Quincy. And then we, uh, using the address that's listed in the book, we found uh, the graveyard in which Augustus Tolton is buried. And we uh, identified the concrete cross that, that marks his grave. And it was, it was a really neat, um, edifying, meaningful experience for the whole family. So I recommend using the book in that way. Uh, Father Augustus Tolton, as you mentioned, the first identifiably African-American Catholic priest in the United States. And, um, you know, kind of going back to the theme we touched on earlier, uh, anti-Catholicism, Catholics were the victims of some of the uh, weaknesses or failings of American society. But Catholics have also participated in some of the failings and weaknesses of American society. And racial prejudice is a good example of that. Uh, Father Tolton was an escaped slave. He fled with his mother as a child across the Mississippi River from Missouri to Illinois as a boy, found freedom in Quincy. They settled in Quincy. Um, a difficult life in poverty, uh, through, especially through the early years of their existence there. Um, but they had been baptized Catholics in Missouri. They were raised on, on uh, a farm owned by Catholics. And so they began practicing the, their Catholic faith in Quincy, where there were several Catholic churches. There was, at that point, there was uh, basically a corner or a basement of one of the churches that were, was reserved for, for Black Catholics. And so they experienced their Catholicism in that way in Quincy. Augustus Tolton, as a boy, had the advantage of getting encouragement from some wonderful pastors, Catholic pastors, uh, that came into his life, and one of them actually encouraged him to become a priest. He was astonished at the idea because he didn't know there was such a thing as a black priest, understandably. There weren't any in the United States at that point, uh, but continued to get encouragement, felt the calling on his own from God, and, and pursued it. Um, it was not a, an easy path because there were all kinds of obstacles. As, as you indicated, no Catholic seminaries in the United States at the time accepted black candidates, and they continued to deny black candidates, even as Tolton and his, his, uh, his pastoral sponsors continued to bang on doors. They, they approached every seminary in the United States and were refused everywhere. Um, the, the story is longer and more complicated than that, but eventually he, he gains admittance to the seminary in Rome, the, the seminary for the Congregation for the Propagation of the Faith, and that's where he's ordained. He's ordained in Rome, returns to the United States. Um, tragically, his life is cut short uh, by illness, <clears throat> but he does enjoy a few years of ministry, uh, especially among Black Catholics in the city of Chicago, but expresses a desire to be buried in Quincy, where he had his start. And so uh, that's where his gravesite is in Quincy, Illinois. And this is, this is, I mean, there's, there's several places in the book like this that, you know, if you are planning a trip, you find surprising places that are surprisingly important. And, you know, one, when one is traveling through Quincy, Illinois, this might not be on your radar, um, but it is very much worth the visit and tells a story both about the history of Catholics in America, but touches also on the history of African Americans and how those things relate and how the church um, has navigated this country's own sort of very complicated historical legacy. Now, in, you alluded to this earlier that there's, you know, there is forthright reflection and criticism uh, that needs to be done about many of the legacies of 
prejudice in the United States, both against uh, Roman Catholics and against African Americans, indigenous folks. But there are a corner corners of the church that are deeply suspicious of the American experiment. And sometimes it's for some of these reasons. And for some, it is other reasons um, having to do with sort of skepticism of the American sort of constitutional settlement. Do you see this book as in some ways seeking to address those concerns of, of Catholics who are very strong in their Catholic identity, but are sort of ill at ease with their identity as Americans? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, definitely, that's not one of the explicit aims of the book. I never directly engage uh, the, the issue or the question that you're referring to. But at the same time, I do definitely think it's in the background. Um, I'm well aware of uh, this approach, this skepticism of the American experiment, the American project. Um, I've written about it elsewhere. I've read about it, uh, you know, uh, voluminously. So I do think that's in the background and in a sense, part of the animating, um, I guess, spirit of this book is what I would call a qualified appreciation for the American experiment, for the Catholic experience in the United States, uh, which I think is the right attitude for an American Catholic to take. Um, as I mentioned earlier, and as we've talked about, there's there's a dark side to American history, and I don't ignore that in this book. I don't think I, I, I ignore that at all, but uh, it's, it's definitely brought front and center, particularly in several of the chapters. Um, but at the same time, America has been a blessing for the church in many ways and for the Catholic peoples of the United States in many ways. And I think that's very much revealed in this book as well. Uh, the book, one thing we haven't really emphasized too much yet, although it's it's there all over the place, if you look at the table of contents or oh, yeah. read the summary of the book, uh, is, is the importance of particular places. Um, you know, the, the importance of, of, of the material, of uh, the, the particular culture in which uh, the church finds itself, in which Catholic people find themselves, in which they, their Catholic faith takes root. And that's happened all over the United States over the course of the last uh 400 years. And I think that uh, should elicit, should call forth in Catholics an appreciation for, for this place, which happens to be in the United States, um, not ignoring, not glossing over whatever faults and imperfections and problems have gone along with that. Um, but uh, at, at the same time, uh, I don't think it's too strong to say cultivating a love a love for the place in which um, our faith has taken root and grown and matured and in many ways blossomed, uh, even, even in the face sometimes of, uh, of hostility or, or uh, a less than friendly climate. Yeah. I, I mean, it really helps in the, in the diversity of the places, the diversity of the church among all of the peoples of the United States, I think really helps bring into relief the fact that Catholic identity and American identity are not, are not simple things um, and that they influence each other and that there is a genuine Catholic American identity that is at some general, at some particular points, of course, at tension with America's, many of America's historical legacies, but it is also contributed positively to the Ameri er, um, American experiment. And you do have, you know, today we have, you know, a Supreme Court in which is, you know, majority Catholic. We have a president of the United States who's Catholic. We have a speaker of the House who's Catholic. Now, those folks might have theological convictions we disagree with, but the fact that, that Catholics are so thoroughly integrated into American life is a genuine accomplishment. And the fact that Catholics can now sort of serve in the Republic in all of these distinguished capacities um, really highlights um, how much the American story has become part of the larger Catholic story. And I think this book is is a great way to examine that. And 
we're in talking about place. So there is there is both um, the family tradition, the that you are continuing with your family, but there's also um, and you alluded to this to this earlier. There's this there's a sense in which these particular places, wh- where do history and geography come together, and where can geography help us? Um, better root ourselves in history, or on, on the other hand, how how history can can help us develop roots to a place. Yeah, right. There's been a lot written about the connection between geography and history, um, and some of it is problematic, frankly, because we do we yeah. want to avoid a situation where we're becoming geographic determinists. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't think that the landscape. Uh, I do think that the landscape shapes human institutions and shapes human history and shapes human culture. I don't think that the landscape determines it, that that geography or climate or whatever uh, determines it. So it's an interplay uh, between human agency um, and the environment in which we're located. Um, But I, I do think that an appreciation for the history of a place um, lends meaning and appreciation and enriches one's experience of the place. Um, and, and I've experienced this on many occasions in many different ways. Um, <clears throat> I think about, uh, you know, one of my chapters is on a, a particular Catholic event related to the Battle, Battle of Gettysburg. And I remember uh, way back when, when I was in graduate school in Philadelphia, which wasn't too far away from the, from the battlefield of Gettysburg, uh, I visited Gettysburg and I had read about the battle, about the Civil War, of course. I was an, uh, an American history major and then a PhD candidate. Uh, and I'd watched the great movie of uh, Gettysburg, uh, which I think came out in 1993 when I was in college, uh, just shortly before graduate school. And so having an understanding of that history really made the uh, experience of being on that battlefield so much more meaningful and really brought it home and, and, and brought it to life. Um, and I, I think, again, you know, the practical utility of this book is uh, that it can do that for so many places, uh, whether it be the places in which we happen to be living, the places in which we are already rooted or, or other places that we have yet to discover, yet to travel to, yet to experience. This brings up a wonderful point. Is this this book is not only informative, it not only, you know, can inspire a travel itinerary, but it's an invitation to inquiry wherever readers may be to examine the church's history in their own place. Um I think of Grand Rapids. I know where the first cathedral was built. Um, you know, it's no, it no longer stands. It was it was destroyed in a fire, and the and the cathedral now currently there is there. But you know, I know the street corner on which that church was. I know the original uh, missions to the Grand River Valley. Um, all of that is not necessarily n- n- actually none of that was learned in school, but it was learned walking the streets, examining plaques, going to the cathedral, see, you know, going into parish libraries, histories of cathedrals, parishes, the, we have a basilica on the west side um, that teaches you about not only the church, but, but the place and how intertwined those are. And it really is. I mean, that's a great way to think about it is, you know, as I was reading this, I started thinking about, okay, are there, are there analogous things in the history of Grand Rapids, you know, and there won't always be, there was, you know, there wasn't a Lincoln, you know, there was never a presidential assassination (laughs) in Grand Rapids, but there, there certainly instances of, you know, uh, discrimination against Catholics. There's instances of Catholicism coming over embedded with an ethnic and linguistic practice. And all of this kind of, you know, this can help open our eyes to look around even, even when we're not on the road planning a family trip, but just look around on our walk to work and start to examine the way that the church has shaped our own communities in history. And that's, that's a wonderful uh, takeaway from this. 
That, that's a really outstanding example, Dan. It's exactly the kind of thing that I hope the book inspires. It's the kind of thing that that I've been doing for decades, which is you know, the genesis of all these chapters. That's where they came from, is that kind of exploration. And, uh, you know, God willing, if there's a volume two, a sequel, you will be my consultant and we'll do something on Grand Rapids. That would be great. <laughs> oh, I'd, I'd love to do it. There's 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 a great history here. And uh, and uh yeah, and some and some great sites, um, Kevin. Thank you so much for this book. Um, I think this can be a real blessing to the church, and I think that this can be a real blessing to any Catholic. Sort of, you know, trying to figure out, okay, you know, how is how is the church shaped the nation. Um, and how has the nation shaped the church throughout the ages, and and how does it continue to do so um, in our own in our own context today? Thank you again so much for this wonderful book, and and thank you for being with us today and sharing it with us. Thank you, Dan. It's been a pleasure. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you'd like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can email our team at producer at acton.org. Until next week, for Acton Line, I'm Gabriel Zsa. Zsa.